Welcome to this educational talk on Parkinson's disease psychosis with Dr. Stuart Isaacson, Director of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center of Boca Raton. The following audio is part of a certified educational activity titled An Expert's Perspective on the Diagnosis and Management of Parkinson's Disease Psychosis in the Long-Term Care Setting. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerviewpress.com forward slash ZZV. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Today I'd like to share a story with you about a patient with Parkinson's disease who has Parkinson's disease psychosis. His name is Phil. He's a 73-year-old gentleman. He's had Parkinson's disease for over 10 years. He's retired 14 years ago. He ran a successful restaurant for over 30 years. He has a son and a daughter and four grandchildren. Phil is just one of numerous patients with Parkinson's disease in the United States who battles Parkinson's disease psychosis. Neuropsychiatric symptoms in Parkinson's disease are among the most common non-motor manifestations that we see. The key and challenging neuropsychiatric non-motor symptom, that's Parkinson's disease psychosis. And it's a common problem because we think it affects 50 or 60% of our patients during the course of Parkinson's disease. Psychosis is persistent, it's progressive, and it's associated with deterioration in quality of life and an increased morbidity and increased mortality. It's a major reason that our patients with Parkinson's disease enter hospitals, have prolonged hospitalizations, and a major reason why they enter long-term care facilities. It's been identified as well as a leading cause of caregiver burden and stress. It can occur without dementia or with dementia, and it's a risk factor for developing dementia. So let's turn to Phil now, and let me tell you a little bit about him. In about 2006, just a few years after his retirement began, he began to notice a tremor in his left hand at rest. Over the next several months, he noticed it a bit on the right side as well. And he noticed that he was stiffer and slower. It took him longer to dress and to bathe. He had some trouble getting out of a car. He was walking slower, he wasn't swinging his arms. It led him to see his primary doctor, who thought he might have Parkinson's disease, which was confirmed by a neurologist. And levodopa was begun. Initially, he had great improvement of his motor symptoms. He was able to continue playing with his grandchildren and to travel. But over several years, the medication effect began to wane and the symptoms would reemerge every couple of hours. And he had to take more and more medicine and have other medicines added on. He wound up taking a levodopa along with the dopamine agonist. In early 2013, though, he began to have some more difficulty. At times, he needed a cane when his medicine wore off to maintain his balance. They decided, he and his wife, to move to Virginia to be closer to their daughter who had just given birth to twin girls. During this time, Phil was still functional. He went to the gym. He walked every day. He played with his grandchildren. He spent time with his family, his wife, his daughter. He visited his son. He was able to help out around the house and to dress and to bathe. But in early 2015, everything changed. His wife unfortunately passed away suddenly. Phil was very depressed. He had repeated remembrances of his wife and he grieved. And over a couple of months, the grief started to subside and he was able to get back to doing his daily life and activities. But he wasn't able to maintain his own daily activities alone, so he moved in with his daughter and her family and his grandchildren. His mood gradually improved and he was euthymic and he had no apparent behavioral disorders. However, over the next four to six months, something new began. He began to complain to his daughter that he was surrounded by ants, but she didn't feel there any ants in her house and they had an exterminator came out and she looked around. He demanded to put down ant traps around. He began to make gestures that the ants were on the floor and he was trying to push them away or step on them. Once he almost tripped trying to step on the ants. He would say when he was asked they were seeing black ants and they were moving in a line, and he would point to the line. But of course, there were no ants there. During this time, though, he was otherwise clear. He played with his grandchildren. He went shopping with his daughter. He knew the date. He knew his family. He wasn't confused. He was 
clear, he wasn't sleepy. He was just seeing these ants that only he saw. Seeing these ants, this type of visual hallucination, is not uncommon. It's one of the most common first symptoms of Parkinson's disease psychosis. We know that there are a number of risk factors for our patients who may develop Parkinson's disease psychosis. Older age, certain types of anti-Parkinson's motor medications, increased severity or duration of the motor Parkinson's disease, cognitive impairment or sleep disturbances, including REM sleep behavior disorder where patients act out their dreams, dementia, and a family history of depression or other mood disorders or of dementia. Phil had a number of these risk factors, and while he was seeing these ants, he began to have even more problems from seeing the ants. He started to see them many times a day, and over several weeks he began to say that they were biting him when he was asleep in his bed. He demanded to have his sheets and his bedding changed. He pointed out scratch marks and, and red marks on his arms, but could never really say when the ants were biting him, and it looked like he kept scratching and scratching at his arms. He began to lose insight that these ants really were not real and he, he really couldn't be consoled by his family in trying to understand that the ants weren't real. And this is what happens with Parkinson's disease psychosis. There's a spectrum of different types of hallucinations and delusions that emerge over time and gradually increase in frequency and severity. And patients eventually lose insight. Visual hallucinations are most common. Now, a hallucination is when there's no stimulus to provoke a visual image. In contrast, an illusion occurs with a stimulus, where a patient may see little flakes on the floor and think they're ants, or look out the window and, and see a tree and think it's a person. Delusions can occur. These are fixed, false beliefs. Certain types of hallucinations are very common when our patients with Parkinson's disease. Hallucinations of passage or presence. Presence is when you feel there's a shadow or a person standing behind, but of course when you turn to look, you don't see anybody there. Passage hallucinations is a feeling that there's a, in the peripheral vision, a moving of a person who might be going away very quickly, but of course there's no one there. And some have tried to characterize hallucinations into simple and complex and multimodal, but we know that these types of hallucinations, which can involve visual and auditory and tactile, and then delusions emerge. Other types of hallucinations are also common in our patients with psychosis symptoms and Parkinson's disease. Copgrass syndrome, where it's a belief that a spouse, a family member, or other friend or close contact has been replaced by an imposter. And Fregoli syndrome, which is a belief that a person, usually a stranger, is actually another known person who's wearing a disguise. And we don't know why there's such typical and similar types of psychosis symptoms in our Parkinson's disease patients, but they seem to be very regular. So let's turn now back to Phil. Over the next six months, Phil continued to complain of seeing these ants on separate occasions, multiple times a day, almost every single day. He would be awake, not sleepy. He would know everything that's going on, and, and suddenly he would stop stamping on ants on the floor or scratching on his arms. He was still carrying out his daily activities, dressing and bathing, needed only minimal support. His mood seemed fairly uh, normal. And Although occasionally he might be irritable, he didn't seem to be sad. His sleep was good, his appetite was good, and his memory seemed preserved as well. However, the next few months, he began to look in the corner of rooms when he was watching television. He said he saw small children there. He couldn't see their faces. Maybe there was a black veal over the face. He wasn't really sure. But these small children would just stand there. Initially, it was one or two, but over a month or two, it began to be three, and then six and then a dozen small children just standing. And instead of just waiting there and looking at him, they began to make faces at him. They began to point at him. They weren't speaking to him, but he began to get a little bit agitated. And at times he would get very distressed and curse at these invisible children that only he saw. He began to look fearful and feel fearful. His sleep deteriorated because he was afraid to be in the bedroom by himself because the children would come in. He began to eat less because he felt everybody was watching him when he was eating. He began to stay in bed more. It appeared that he was depressed, but when asked, he didn't seem sad, just afraid of these children and these ants and all these other things no one else could see. He began to need more help because he didn't get out of bed. 
Soon, he was asking his daughter and son-in-law not to leave the home and go to work, to stay home with him and, and protect him. During the evening, he would only sit with family watching television. He was no longer engaged. Finally, it got to a breaking point. He wasn't eating. He wasn't sleeping. He wasn't doing his daily activities. It was too much for his daughter and his son. They were fearful for their grandchildren uh, who were in the home uh, with, with Phil. They made the decision to put him into a nursing facility. About 75% of patients who have a psychosis with Parkinson's enter a nursing home facility compared to only a little more than half of patients without a psychosis. When they enter a facility, they usually stay there long term, at least twice as long as those without a psychosis, and many are not able to leave. So by September 2016, he, Phil was admitted to a nearby nursing home. When he was uh, initially evaluated, a physical examination revealed that he was taking short steps, he was walking slow, his posture was a little bit stooped forward, he has a little bit of a tremor that was still persistent in the right hand, but when he became agitated, it was in both hands. And he seemed stiff and slow in his overall movements. He was evaluated looking at his mental state examination. He seemed fearful while he was lying in bed. His speech was somewhat low, probably from the motor symptoms of Parkinson's. He seemed to be distracted by looking at things on the floor and the corner and out the window. He was awake, but sometimes inattentive for these reasons. He wasn't always cooperative because he was afraid that when he looked at the examiner, he would be distracted by these children and, and bugs. He seemed to have impaired judgment, and he didn't seem to have any insight whatsoever that these hallucinations were not real. His Parkinson's disease uh, itself and seemed to be under reasonable motor control, but the Parkinson's disease psychosis symptoms that were still untreated was so problematic. Despite the high prevalence of symptoms of psychosis among our patients with Parkinson's disease, there is still increasing need for awareness and identification and diagnosis of Parkinson's disease psychosis. We don't know why our patients and their caregivers don't bring out the symptoms earlier. It may be that there's a stigma or they're embarrassed or they're afraid to share knowing that it might imply that they're having trouble with their thinking or a dementia is emerging or they might need the long-term care. We have to ask about these symptoms. And when we ask, we find out they can begin early, but they gradually progress over the course of the disease. In our clinical practice, we have to raise this awareness among our patients that Parkinson's disease psychosis is part of the underlying degenerative disease process of Parkinson's disease and occurs in more than half of all people with Parkinson's disease. Evaluating Parkinson's disease psychosis once it's uh, identified is very important. We have to identify and evaluate other causes that may be present that can bring out the symptoms of Parkinson's psychosis. We look at the Parkinson's disease medications because dopaminergic medications can increase psychosis, although we now understand that they don't cause the actual psychosis of Parkinson's disease. This seems to be part of the degenerative process in serotonergic pathways in the brain, whereas the motor symptoms reflect dopaminergic degeneration. But we look at the Parkinson's medicines, we look for systemic illnesses, like urinary tract infections, which are so common, dehydration, which is so common in our aging population who have Parkinson's disease. We look at other medications, centrally acting anticholinergics, and other medications that can precipitate confusion or psychosis. We do a general evaluation of, of blood work, looking at hepatic and renal or other metabolic dysfunction. We look at overall medications. We try to minimize hearing and visual and other sensory deprivation. The infections uh, I mentioned are so important to think about. And we look sometimes at the brain to make sure the patient hasn't suffered a stroke or a traumatic injury from falling. In 2005, at the NIH, a group of neurologists and psychiatrists came together in a consensus conference that led to a publication in 2007 that led to diagnostic criteria for Parkinson's disease psychosis. It outlined that you needed to have the presence of at least one of four cardinal symptoms, hallucinations, delusions, false sense of presence, or illusions. Parkinson's disease motor diagnosis has to be confirmed. And this is typically done by having slowness or what we call bradykinesia, along with resting tremor or rigidity. The symptoms of Parkinson's psychosis must have occurred after the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, separating it clinically 
from Lewy body dementia, although pathologically they look very similar. And we have to also exclude other causes of psychosis, schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease. The symptoms have to be persistent for at least a month, separating it from delirium. And importantly, Parkinson's psychosis can occur with or without insight, with or without dementia, and with or without dopaminergic Parkinson's therapy. Indeed, in this consensus conference, they pointed out that Parkinson's disease motor dopaminergic medications are neither necessary nor sufficient for psychosis to emerge. So Phil was evaluated in these ways, other causes of psychosis were excluded, and based on his history, his examination, and on the criteria that we use to evaluate Parkinson's psychosis, Phil was diagnosed with Parkinson's psychosis. The diagnosis was discussed with his family, and management options were discussed. We first looked at his medications. He was taking levodopa and promipexol, which is a dopamine agonist. We tend to minimize certain Parkinson's medications first, like anticholinergics, amantadine, and dopamine agonists. We might also minimize MAOB and COMPT inhibitors. And then finally, we may have to lower the levodopa. But there's a consequence for lowering these medications, and that is the motor symptoms will tend to progress. So while we tend to withdraw amantadine, anticholinergics, and dopamine agonists, we very often cannot continue to lower levodopa for these reasons. Phil's promipexol was initially uh, lowered to twice a day. The dose was cut in half and eventually had to be tapered off. As it was lowered, his symptom psychosis improved somewhat, but they still persisted. He seemed a little slower, so we were afraid to lower the levodopa in Phil for fear that he might fall. Over the next month or so, despite having the promipexol withdrawn, he continued to have hallucinations. And now he began to have some delusions. He began to feel that people were emitting smells and gases from the body, that gas was coming into the facility and was affecting him in different ways. He would say that he could smell something strange. At this point, the family was called in for a conference to discuss other options in trying to treat the psychosis symptoms of hallucinations and delusions. He had already had a reduction in his Parkinson's motor medications. The promipexol was withdrawn. He had some more tremor and trouble with mobility. We really couldn't lower the levodopa uh, further. So it led to the discussion of beginning an antipsychotic. Initially, the family was somewhat taken aback. An antipsychotic, is this what he really needs? But most people who have Parkinson's disease psychosis, the psychosis will continue to increase in frequency and severity. Insight is lost, delusions emerge, and you have to begin to use an antipsychotic in these folks in order to be able to prevent them from having deterioration in their daily activities, in their social interactions, and prevent them from becoming more and more fearful and withdrawn. Sometimes antipsychotics need to be used to manage the symptoms of PD psychosis. Antipsychotics, both typical and atypical, tend to block dopamine D2 receptors and we've thought that this is the main reason why they have antipsychotic efficacy. More recently, in Parkinson's psychosis, we've begun to understand that it's not just overactivity of dopamine, but also an overactivity of serotonergic 5-HT2A receptors. In Parkinson's psychosis, we have to be careful using most antipsychotics because when they block dopamine D2 receptors, they can worsen mobility and perhaps increase the risk of falling. And while both quetiapine and clozapine do block dopamine D2 receptors at the low doses we tend to use in Parkinson's psychosis, it may be that they also block serotonin 5-HT2A receptors, and some of their efficacy probably comes from this receptor antagonism. Pimavanserin is a selective serotonin 5-HT2A inverse agonist. It only blocks that receptor, 5-HT2A, and as an inverse agonist, actually turns down its intrinsic activity. Pimavanserin has no affinity for dopaminergic, adrenergic, histaminergic, nor muscarinic receptors. Pimavanserin 
received regulatory approval from the FDA based on a pivotal trial that was published in the Lancet in 2014. This phase three placebo-controlled blinded trial evaluated almost 200 patients over a six-week randomized trial design. The primary endpoint was a change from baseline in the SAPS-PD. In the pivotal trial, at the end of six weeks, we saw a significant improvement in the primavanserin-treated group compared to placebo, with the p-value of 0.0014. We also saw improvement in clinical global impression scale as rated by both the investigators and also when rated by caregivers and patients. And importantly, we saw a significant improvement over the six-week period in the primavanserin arm in caregiver burden scale. Adverse events that occurred during the clinical trial program that were greater than placebo included peripheral edema, urinary tract infection, falls, confusional state, hallucinations. But overall, primavanserin was well tolerated, did not have significant safety concerns in the clinical trial program, and most importantly, it did not worsen motor function. Since that time, data from open label extension trials has been presented. In these open label extension, patients were evaluated four weeks into the extension trial, which was about 10 weeks after beginning pimavanserin because the pivotal trial that was blinded and placebo controlled was six weeks in duration. At the 10 week point, we were able to demonstrate durability of the treatment effects seen with pimavanserin, as well Patients who received placebo for six weeks during the pivotal trial, who were now taking primavanserin, had the same improvement over the four-week period as was seen in the pivotal trial. Over a two-year period, patients seemed to maintain the global impression scale improvement without a loss of durability of efficacy. Caregiver burden scale was also evaluated in the open label extension. And at about the nine-month mark, we saw a continued either improvement or about the same in most patients in the caregiver burden scale. And at six weeks, we actually saw an improvement over placebo. Pimavanserin is the only drug that is on label to treat Parkinson's disease psychosis. The two other drugs that can be used that don't worsen motor function are used off label. Low dose clozapine for the treatment of uh, Parkinson's disease psychosis was evaluated in two trials. One of these trials demonstrated the improvement at four weeks over placebo using a scale called the Brief Psychosis Rating Scale, as well as improvement in SAPS and CGI. There was no adverse event differences between placebo and clozapine and things like orthostatic lightheadedness, memory, drooling, constipation, uh, confusion, or sedation. The second study showed a similar result. Despite the clinical evidence of efficacy for clozapine and the overall tolerability, it is almost never used. Less than 2% of our patients with Parkinson's disease psychosis have received clozapine. And the main reason for this is for the low risk of agranulocytosis that can occur in 1% or so of our patients exposed to clozapine, even at the low doses. Because of this risk, it's mandated in the label that patients who begin clozapine have to have weekly blood tests monitoring for white blood cell counts and red blood cell counts every week for six months, every other week for six months, and then monthly thereafter. Perhaps for this reason, as well as for uh, sedation that can occur at higher doses, almost all patients are not treated with clozapine despite the efficacy seen in the two trials. Rather, quetiapine had been used prior to the availability of primavanserin being approved by the FDA. Quetiapine has been looked at in several smaller trials, and some of these have demonstrated a lack of efficacy or intolerability. It does not seem to worsen motor function, though. One study did show some improvement uh, in psychosis symptoms over placebo, but this was a study with about 16 patients. Quetiapine does not cause agranular cytosis. The biggest limiting side effect that limits efficacy has been sedation in many of our Parkinson's patients, even at the low doses used. Now, all antipsychotics have a black box warning 
highlighting an increased mortality for elderly patients with dementia-related psychosis. Quetiapine and clozapine has this black box warning, so we have to be aware and have our patients and their caregivers aware of this warning as well. Pimavanserin has a modified black box warning. When used for patients with dementia-related psychosis that's unassociated with Parkinson's psychosis, the black box warning is the same. But it's modified such that when we use pimavanserin to treat our patients with Parkinson's psychosis, that black box warning would not be applicable. So at the conference, it was decided to begin pimavanserin. Uh, Phil's care team and his family decided uh, that pimavanserin might be able to reduce his symptoms of delusions and hallucinations. Pimavanserin has begun at a dose of 34 milligrams once daily. And after beginning pimavanserin, over the next few weeks, he began to have improvement in his psychosis symptoms, similar to what we saw in the pivotal trial, where pimavanserin once begun, we begin to see a reduction in the frequency and severity of delusions and hallucinations within about two weeks, with more improvement at four weeks, and the maximum improvement by six to eight weeks. He began to interact with residents and caregivers and aides and nurses, and even his family was more relaxed, began to be able to partake in more of his daily uh, dressing and bathing. And because of his improvement in the frequency and severity of the psychosis symptoms, they began to wonder whether he could return home to live with his daughter. So we've spoken a lot about Phil and about Parkinson's disease psychosis. It's the leading cause of nursing home placement in our patients. And as such, clinicians in long-term care settings need to have a high index of suspicion and ask patients whether they're seeing things that aren't there or feeling things are occurring uh, to them that they're not able to uh, control. And they need to be able to, to look at this and look at their mental state in addition to the motor symptoms that are being treated. After ruling out contributing medical conditions, and reviewing the patient's history and looking at all the medications that patients are taking, reducing anticholinergics, and reducing Parkinson's motor medications, but making sure it doesn't worsen their mobility or balance, often an antipsychotic may need to be used. So although the antipsychotics quetiapine and clozapine have been used for many years off-label to treat the symptoms of Parkinson's psychosis, the recent approval by the FDA of pimavanserin a selective 5-HT2A inverse agonist to treat Parkinson's psychosis on label makes us have another treatment option for our patients who are suffering from the hallucinations and delusions associated with PD psychosis. Hopefully, our discussion of Phil and of Parkinson's psychosis has been helpful and interesting. And the new entry of being able to treat PD psychosis with Pimavancin will be helpful to our patients. Thank you for your attention. This activity has been jointly provided by Penn State College of Medicine and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerviewpress.com forward slash ZZV. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Acadia Pharmaceuticals Incorporated.